Now, you might be wondering why a boomerang is sitting in front of Beatty's Five Mile Bar Pool. Well, that's because we're kind of getting in the mood for what's going to happen tonight. It's BT's Fly Tying Friday. And tonight, 18 November 2022, Paul Fidelis is going to talk to us about Australian flies. And we're going to talk about buffer zones and thread control. Some really boring stuff. Hi there. We're the BDs from Boise, Idaho. And welcome to Fly Tying Friday. Paul Fidelis is from Port Macquarie, New South Wales, Australia, where he enjoys his retirement from a career in high school sports coaching and teaching. He is a ROTC graduate from Colorado State University. After college, he was commissioned in the U.S. Marine Corps as an infantry officer. He was discharged in 1972 as a captain with two Combat Valor Awards and a Combat Action Ribbon earned in Vietnam. In 1973, he emigrated to Australia to become a sports coach. While coaching at Barker College, a private high school, his team racked up 376 wins, 68 of which were consecutive. He earned numerous coaching awards, including New South Wales ABC Schools Coach of the Year. He started tying flies and fly fishing in 2008 and is a member of the Sydney Fly Rodders. Hastings Fly Fishers Club, and Coffs Coast Fly Fishing Club. Tonight, Paul will be tying four Australian flies he uses in his part of the world. And Paul, it's all yours. Hi, my claim to fame, my fly tying claim to fame is I live in Australia. You're not going to get Eric Austin this week. I spent 30 <laughs> years teaching and coaching basketball. And after retiring in 2007, I took up fly tying and uh, fly fishing after that. I lived in Port Macquarie, we call it Port. This is, in, this is a land lease where you own your house, but you rent the land. You get two bedrooms, two baths, a sitting room, which ended up being my fly tying village. And um, I got rush hour here. This is rush hour in Port Macquarie. There is one car. <laughs> My uh, knowledge of saltwater fly tying and fly fishing really started when I got here. Experienced Australian fly tires will probably cringe at what I'm doing. I guess the bottom line is that my flies do catch fish. The Hastings Club is really not a fishing club, more like a family. We have a monthly event that many of the wives come along. We travel by convoy, everybody fishes together, it gets crowded at the river, stops for morning tea, stops for barbecue lunch, and the ever-present raffle. I lived in port for four months before I went to any function, be it fishing, the RSL, or the Newport Village where they didn't have a raffle. The RSL is the Return and Services League or is stray inversion of the American Legion. There are a few fly fishers in the area as most people use lures and bait, the nearest tackle store that handles any fly fishing stuff is 100 miles north of here. So we make do with what is available and provides. Postage from the US is a really big expense. Because of this, I use three types of threads when I tie. I got sheer 14 which I think is an English thread, woolly nylon, which is nylon stretch over locking thread, and invisible thread that I buy from the local supermarket. The flies in the show are the ones I know and use, not counting the traditional clousers and deceivers. This is most of what I have learned, actually probably all of what I've learned. I've included the tying instructions in the PowerPoint as a backup to my Zoom demo. First slide is a, called a redheaded stepchild, and it's for fish freshwater herring. First time I visited Port, I was invited to a club event, and it was their fly of the month, so I tied a whole bunch of them and everybody got one. So everybody's on the river and everybody's fishing with my fly. I'm fishing with my fly. I'm doing everything right. And I'm the only one not catching any fish. And this went on for about 10 or 20 minutes. And then finally goes out, someone pipes up, oh, they like a bit of movement. And so then I started catching fish. What got me was that at 10 a.m. everybody stopped fishing and walked back to where the cars were parked. And it was morning tea time. And with tea, coffee, cakes, scones, brownies, etc., and everyone had a special chair. 
right? I, me and me and my wife now have our own chairs. The shoot heel special is one that I tied. I made up myself. It's one I made up for herring. The um, first time I used it, I did, I did quite well. These are the special materials I use. The um, makeup brush for tails, the wire for the cable wire, Whoa. and the possum tail that I put there. I'm not going to use the possum tail, but since everybody there shows me all the good stuff that I had, I had to put the possum tail there to show off. Um, I got an entire possum for $15, the entire pelt. And when you cut it up, you get a lot of loose fur, and that's what I'm going to use for the dubbing. I got the pictures up and I'll tell you how to fish it. Okay, I use a five weight rod, floating line, my braided leader, six foot of six pound tippet. Okay, what I do is I, I cast up stream and I put my rod tip in the water and you make the rod and, and your line a straight line and you follow the line until it's in front of you. And then you start little twitch strips. I have to demonstrate it when I do the tie. And you strip, keep bringing in, the, you strip twitch, but you're not bringing any line. The file jump forward and back. And then when you feel you hit, you strip strike. I found out the hard way that when you fish salt water, you strip strike or you miss them. You lift a rod up. You know, I went fishing with one guy once, and every time I lifted the rod up, missed it, the guy would go, trout strike. You know? The next one is um, Hendo's Flea. That's a whiting pattern. Our club patron, Brian Henderson, I don't know whether you guys know him or not. He said, Board of Governors, the FFI Executive Committee. Right. And he lives here in Port, or he lives up in, in Foster North of here. And um, the special materials, I use um, the invisible thread. And if you look at the little plastic, you know, you get your Ziploc bags and you cut it and use that for the, uh, the, the skin of the top of the fly. And then uh, I wasted a whole day fishing this fly at Smith's Lake in the sand flats. And uh, I'm stripping, I'm casting to the hair, the uh, whiting, and they're following the whiting. And you know, like when a trout, you slow down your fly so that the trout can get it. And these, they look at it. And I thought maybe there's something wrong with the fly. Then afterwards, it says you got to keep it moving because otherwise they think it's dead. The next one is a salmon fly or a white bait pattern. I've used the top two. They're pretty ugly, but they catch fish. And then the bottom one I kept just in case they were bigger fish and I could cut cut it off. I didn't I only tied that one. The materials that I use are different is I got woolly nylon and the bling, which is the little um, bits in the bottom that you can fly in the Chinese junk shops. I think every mall in Australia has one Chinese junk shop. And I got these picture here. This is a picture of the they, the, the salmon migrate north along the coast, chasing the, the uh, bag, schools of um, bait fish. And what you do is you, if you're lucky, you can see them in the, along the beach, you can cast that way. My only experience is with, in a boat. This is from Tasmania. I wasn't there. I, um, I got the picture off the internet and, and was able to show it. And what you do is you, um, Cruise up to the edge. Ours was in a you know, little bay. Cruise up to the edge, cast into the thing, let your line sink, and strip like crazy. I used an eight weight rod, clear sinking line, and a braided, my bladed leader with 20 pound tippet. The most important thing is you have to strip strike. I've been fishing for salmon twice, and each time my brand new um, clear sinking tip line got run over by the electric motor and chewed up. And so when I, we were gonna go again the third time and I called the guy up that I, who has the boat and asked him, do I need to buy a new fly line? And he says, no, we're not going to go this time. So. This is another one of my flies. My wife named this one. This is, seems to be the go-to fly for bass in the Australian River, Australian River bass. First time you use it, I caught a dozen fish. 
and a 43 centimeter, centimeter bass, which is pretty big here, which is around 16 and a half inches in real measurements. All right. The materials are woolly nylon. The woolly nylon is $7 for 1,500 meters. That's 4,921.26 feet in real measurements. And the, um, the wing I get is from a strip of curtain fringe from the Spotlight Fabric Store. We only got one sort of craft store in Port Macquarie and they charge through the nose, but this one's pretty good because you get a meter for $8.95. Or if I wanted to get flash from the US, it cost me almost $8 just to get it mailed here. And as far as fishing it, put that up. As far as fishing it, it's named Orange Bass Flopper. You throw it out, you slap it in the water, a lousy caster is better off than a good cast. You push it out into the trees or the bushes. And if you're lucky, if you're good enough, you can bounce it off one of the trees into the water. It sits there flat. You twitch it a couple of times, and sometimes they'll come up and hammer it. The Endor Pinky, Rodney Adams um, was the I got the idea of the plastic tubing for the body. He's a real flathead whisperer. You fish for flathead waiting on the salt flats at low tide. The flathead buries itself in the sand and ambushes its prey by, by swimming by as a prey swims by. There's a picture of a flathead. The flathead fillets are really good tasting, but the only time I ever get them is when I go to the store and buy them because they can always release them. And they say anything over 55 inches or 50, yeah, about 55 inches, you should let go because it's usually a female and they're the ones that you know, do the breeding. These are the materials I use. Once again, the woolly nylon and Brian Henderson taught me how to fish this, is you, you start right at the shore because the fish could be right in the sand along the shore and you get two plus rod lengths of line. You're braided later, six feet, which is 1.828 meters in metrics of tippet. All right, you cast along the shore to the left side. If you're lefty, left-handed caster, then you start on the right-hand side. You strip, strip, pause the length of the leader. So I'm doing um, strip, strip, pause, length of the leader, and the tippet. Then you roll cast to the right of your last cast and you repeat it. And what you're doing is you cast, making a whole half circle until you've covered. If you want, you can go back, <clears throat> cover the ground, and then you move forward the length of your um, leader and tippet. And usually you, that way you cover the whole length of the, of the sand flats. This is another Brian Henderson fly. Um, I'm not going to, I don't have any results. You tie a um, shrimp pattern and you put the foam on it, but the foam on it is not supposed to float. The foam on it is just supposed to slow down the sink rate so that when it sinks, it sinks parallel to the ground, to the, you know, the bottom of the water. And then you, when you do your strip, strip pause, it brings it up and it goes down slowly again. And so it's sort of like a up and down, up and down. And uh, that way, and, and you fish this the same way that you fish the, the Endor Pinky. Weed flies, that's what um, people fish, they're called blackfish or luteric, and they eat weeds along the rocks. And people fish along the rocks. Here in Port Macquarie, there's a breakwater and they hang off the, off the breakwater and fish there. The bait fisher is burly with a mix of weed and sand. Now, one thing I learned that whenever you fly fish in, the, in, the, in the, the flats or anywhere, you take a long bread and you throw bread out in the areas. And what it does, it gets this little small little fish um, active. And from there, the other fish get active and it's easier to catch them. They use, um, here they use long use sinkers and a long stick bottom. And it just sits there and they wait. And you, it's one of those things where the bottom has to go all the way under and start going away before they'll um, strike and cook the fish. And then they're really a good fighting fish. And I guess they taste good because I, but I've never caught any on, on these, but I know this is what they use. And if you're going to fish it with a fly, well, then you use your floating line and a weighted fleet weed fly, which makes it seems easier. And then Muzz Wilson's BMF, it's called a BMS, which is Bull and Mary. It's some area where he fished. And it's a, I've caught 
saltwater brim and freshwater trout on that fly. The freshwater one doesn't have bead chain eyes. Now, Muzz Wilson was a, a legendary fly tire and fisherman here in Australia. And it's worth checking out the links that are put up on the screen there. Uh, when he died, he took the secret of his fuzzle dubbing with him and no one's been able to do it yet. And packs of the dubbing are, are very rare. The mullet fly, I don't know the name of this. I don't know whether I made it up or I got somewhere, but I don't even remember when I tied it. So it was in his, it was in my box and it was great. I, it was that good I selected for the Hastings October Fly of the Month. Our website has instructions and a video. 40 minutes of fishing with bread flies for all these schools of mullet. The mullet would just chase but not eat the bread flies, regardless of the size, floating, sinking, it didn't really matter. So I looked in my box and I said, ah, why not this one? And 30 minutes with the unnamed, I guess it's going to be, I landed 19 mullet and had multiple quick releases. The thing is, you cast far past where you think the school is, and which is where the bigger far, bigger fish are, and you strip, strip, pause, strip, strip, pause, and remember to strip strike any strike, any strike, and you never lift your rod until you have a fish on. If you don't get a large fish, you'll just have to suffer with the small one. Now I got the Hastings Club there. I got you know, information there. I have a blog that I haven't touched for seven years. This is where I get to brag. Um, my daughter pretty much did most of the work on the blog with me, and she left the stray to go work for the Australian government. She's been to Milan, um, Dubai, and now she's the, I get to brag now, she's the Australian Consul General in Frankfurt, Germany. And, you know, we have a, a YouTube club, YouTube channel also in the club. My tips, okay. Sally Hansen's no matter where, how I do it, you tighten the leak, it leaks. So I put it in a cup. And the other thing is a double zonker. I got the um, these film caps. You put a piece of elastic between the top and the bottom and put some tissue in it. And then when you take a fly off, you just put it in the bag. And because the cap's got a lid, you don't lose the cap. And it just hangs there. And the whistle is there in case you ever need help. I may, mainly when you fish... In the snowies, you're bush bashing all the time. So if you fall down and you need some help, this is an, you're able to get to get some help. This is my high tech tying area. I got two um, selfie cameras I got from Kmart for ten dollars. On the left hand side, I got a um, USB hub which runs all the way back on an extension to my computer. And the lights were too great, so I got some of that nonstick stuff and used it as to to um, cut back on some of the glare. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to say there are no kangaroo, there were no kangaroos, wombats injured in the preparation of this PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> However, one possum did will his body to science. Okay, first one's gonna be the shoot hill. I'm using red thread. Now I put my thread on a bit different than you do, Al, but I don't waste any either. And what I do is I put it in the tip in my hackle pliers and just wrap it that way. You just go as fast as you want, Paul. Okay. Well, when I tie for the club, initially I would tie and they would be that slow that I had to keep going back. I always tie my tails on or my ribbing on first because a couple of times I'd tie it on and it, it would come loose. This this stuff here is, was extremely expensive, this wire. It was like you got a meter for $3. And I'm using one of my wife's makeup brushes. She can buy all the... Um, cosmetics she wants, but I get the brushes. And what do I do for whenever I use that is I measure the length of the fly, the whole body, and then I cut the ta tail short and tie it in the middle. And when I take it back, 
I end up getting the right proportions. Now, because my hands are so soft and wonderful, because I've never worked, I have to actually use water on my fingers to, to actually get a hold of the material and when I put the dubbing on. And I, I make a bundle and take little bits out. And most of my flies are messy. Because when I reverse rib, and I have special wire cutting scissors. And I found that most flies that you do for salt water, they say you're supposed to put a red head on it, a red neck or whatever it is. And that's because they supposedly take them as gills. I'm gonna rough it up. Naps the shoot hill special. Oh yeah, and the and the shoot hill and the twitch I showed, it's just this way. You're holding the line and you're just twitching so that the fly is sort of moving forward and back. Next one is the, um, the salmon fly. And because I'm using the woolly nylon and it's slick, I usually put a dab of Sally Hansen's on the on the hook. Now that's half the parts. Now what I use is I jokingly say nine or five pieces of the the flash that I've got. Right. And now this is the thick stuff and I'm shot all over the place until I remembered that um, you put anti-static on it and it makes it a lot easier to tie on. And what happens is, is you tie it on at the tail. You tie the tail on. And you'll notice how it, everything's in the way. And so what I worked out, you know, if I wanted to wrap, like I'm going to wrap it, well, then the fly, the thread was always in the way. So what I did is I just wrap it up halfway. Put a wrap behind it. Bring the line up. I have half hitch. And what I'm doing now is I'm going to make a body wrapping this stuff around the hook. And now I just bring my thread because it's a lot white, you can't tell where it is. And I bring it back and I tie it off right here. And I whip finish. right there. First time I used that retractable bobbin, until you get the hang of it, you always cut it and next you know it shoots all over the place because it, and I get about, about the length of the body and I cut that off. 
And then the bling, which are these things here, you get all sorts of different kinds. And what I do is, um, first thing I did was I lost my um, UV. I put a little depth of UV because because I'm using cheap UV from China, getting it on the spot I want is troublesome. And so what I do is I got this tool. One of my basketball players' dad was a dentist. He was also my dentist. And um, he gave me this dental tool. He also took me fly fishing for the first time. And luckily, I got a backup. Well, that was lucky there. When I had my triple bypass, they took the vein out of my arm so my heart would work. And uh, unfortunately, now my hand shakes all the time. I don't think my marksmanship would be any good now with a rifle because I couldn't keep the hand still. And to save time, I'm not going to coat the whole thing with UV resin. It's quite fun catching these things, but the, what happens is there's so many boats when you're in the in the bay or whatever, and they end up chasing them down. And um, the, I remember the best story is the guy that uh, the boat I was on, he had the automatic um, controls you know, where you use your hand to adjust the electric motor. Well, he put it on this wrist so that he's casting here and he's kept going like this. And at one stage there, he couldn't stop it. And we cruised right through the middle of the school, which really made the, all the people around us, you know, the eight or, eight or nine boats that were around the school somewhat happy, but I learned some new cuss words. You know. Next fly, I'm using red woolly nylon. And it's my fly. It's the orange bass flopper. I cover the hook with. That. It's available here in the States from both Uni as a Uni stretch and from Danville as nylon stretch. Okay. Thank okay. You. What's it cost? On my website is a couple bucks a, a spool. Yeah, well, this is nine bucks. You can't get it now. All right, now I've got the foam and I use the um, Chernobyl ant cutter, but I make it longer, the extra, I add a little extra bit on. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to coat the thread I put on with a bit of Sally Hansen's and I wanna put orange side down and I want the tail to hang just over and I'm going three turns. Go under it one turn and then come back. What I take is I divide one of these legs in quarters. Okay, so you take one leg, tie it on one side, get another one. Tighten that up and you take three turns. Make another segment with three turns. Now, if you'll notice that there's a, a round ridge on the edge. And what I do is I cut the thread, or not thread, the foam, to get rid of that round ridge. Because when you fold it over, And I take the flash, which is some of that curtain fringe, take nine or five pieces, and you lay it 
on your first turn is on the front segment, and then you go over the top to the back segment and fold it over. You good to go back and fold this over. Three good turns, go under, don't have, doesn't matter what it looks like. And I wind up with the portion here on top. Cut that off. I like to do the corners. Don't want to cut that off. And then you get two more legs. And these are in line. Well, half inches to finish it off. If you want, you can trim the legs. I don't bother. This we want to be just past the back of it and release the pressure. And the last step is to turn it upside down and make sure everything is straight because it gets twisted so that we got all in straight. You want to coat the bottom. Sally Hansen's. I had once, I was fishing and I cast one out and there was a swirl underneath it. And I left it there and waited and twitched it. And the fish came up and actually slapped it with its tail. And then I twitched it some more and then it came up and grabbed the fish. And that's the orange bass flopper. Next one using the same thread is the Yendor Pinky, which is a um, flathead fly. In the interest of saving time, and also to prevent myself from embarrassment, I've already tied the bead head or the uh, eyes on. And once again, Sally Hansen's, if I'm using the woolly nylon, it just keeps it from slipping, I think. I should get a discount from Sally Hansen's. Okay, now the first thing you get is the white pattern. Because it flies up, upside down, the top of the fish are usually dark and the bottom are usually light, and so we just use white. I may have a bit too much on it but you can always trim it off. And when you tie that in, doesn't matter length right now. And I've got this plastic stretched stuff tubing that you get from the Chinese junk shop. And what you do is you want to cut the front at an angle so that you can tie it down and you want to tie it down on top And now all I'm doing is I'm using touching wraps, keeping the, the nylon tight. And the next step is black. And what I do is I go over the eye to do a good whip finish out. Oh, you hit, you nailed it. Good job. <laughs> I've been practicing. 
And if you get some in the, I always do this. If you get some in the eye, I have these old hackles nearby. And I just run it through to make sure they're clean. Take it off. And this is the way it goes through. And you want to go here. And when you trim it, you want to trim it so that the at an angle. So it semi looks like a fish. And that's it. You can coat that with Sally Hansen's or not. Okay. They lay in the water and they, you know, and that's about their vision, about that much. And if it's something out here they don't bother with, which is okay. why you, you know, you cast and you use that whole 360 to cover all the, the water. And then you walk forward because you're waiting in the sun, you know, in, in the flats, the sand flats, and they're married in there. And sometimes you look down and there might even be a big image of where a, um, and then uh, I see Al's got my um, braided leader. I use I use that most of the time in salt water because you want your I don't use don't get much chance to um, fish surface and so they sink without weight. So you got a floating line. the The leader will sink. And you use a tippet, and so that you know it's down, but it's not too far down, and it's quite good. And uh, surprisingly, the tippet turns over your um, or sorry, the, the braided leader turns over the tippet really well. And the other thing I do is I never use less than a six pound tippet, even when I fish for trout. One of the Guys here in Australia, pretty famous book writer, whatever, and I was one of his classes. And he said he doesn't use less than six pound tippet. He says, What good does it do to use seven pound tippet and you catch the fish in your life and it breaks it off? Yeah. Hey, Paul, do you make your own furl leaders? Yes, I do. Um, I've actually I've got, I, um, Used to do them in Sydney. I sent Al a video. I don't know whether you still got it. Of how to make them? We do. It's on our it's on our uh, Facebook page. And our weekly tip is uh, a little bit more about buffer zones and thread control. And I was kind of hoping that um, that Dutch Bachman would would be on tonight because he happens to have. In case any any of you or your clubs are interested. Got one of the absolute best presentations on thread control that you can ever see. So it's uh, you need to have some time, but uh, it's a, a PowerPoint presentation that is absolutely worth Where is the it? time. Dutch has it. Dutch is the one that made it and, and presents so, it. He has it, and he presents it to your club oh, either okay. in person or over Zoom. Okay. Al, excuse me, but it may be on his website as well. He gives a lot of that away. Uh, oh, okay. Flyfishingskills.com. Fly, yeah, thank you. Uh, Flyfishingskills.com. All right. And getting into our, our tip tonight, let me switch over to uh, my newly made glasses from last week. It's got bifocals. I mean, I'm, I'm uptown now, folks. We're going to start out talking about thread torque because it's a... Um, what this is all about is, is dealing with thread torque. And I've got a hook here with um, thread already attached, just so we can do a quick, a quick demo on the, on the thread torque and, and what it really does and how the material reacts and so forth. And here's just a piece of material, a piece of foam. And I want you to notice that you see how the foam twists and it starts to turn away. We'll do that again. And then when I didn't try to control the thread torque at all, it'll go clear to the other side of the hook. I also want you to notice something. Let me tighten it up here. You see how it kicks up in the air on this side and this side? 
And if you want to control that, that's the equivalent of flare if it's hair or whatever you're you're working with. That's when it goes out of control. And sometimes you want to control this. And that's where buffer zones come in. And here's the way we we could control a part of this. Let me um, put a buffer zone in. Now, what I'm doing right now is putting in some light wraps on this foam. And what, what that does is pro, it's provide a buffer between the tight thread wraps and the material, the foam. And so see now on the ends here, it's not flared clear up in the air like it was just a few minutes, a few minutes ago. It was at just about that angle. So now we can really bail into this. And it's still, we've got it anchored here in the middle and we have the wraps out here keeping the flare or the bounce of the material under control. Now there's another way to control that. And uh, let me just turn tie this off real quick. I'll set that aside. And we'll get this guy out right here. Now here's a place where we've controlled with the use of a buffer zone and th uh, thread control both in the same application. And this is the tail of a, what would be a wolf or something like that. And um, I want you to see that uh, we'll point it out here. You've got uh, tied on here. And as we wrap in this direction, we use slightly softer wraps. And as we come back this way, we use tighter wraps. Well, right here at the tie-in point, we need to talk about using a temporary buffer zone to make our job easier. And I'm going to show you just how we're going to do that. I'll set that aside. Here's another hook that's just got the thread already attached to it. I've got a pre cleaned and stacked bundle of hair. And let me just get rid of all these short guys. We don't want them. Now I wanna show you one of the things that's really frustrating. In fact, I'm gonna get way out here on the butt end so that I can demonstrate my point and then I'll show you how to counteract when you tie your material on, you want to really anchor it in place. And you see how all that hair flares back? It gets in my way. And to try to continue to wrap without snagging this stuff is a pain. So let's just back up. This is where we put in a temporary buffer zone. I'm going to measure my hair for length, set it in place. And what I'll do now is I will put some really soft buffer zone wraps here. Just snug it up just a little bit. Keep it under control so those butt ends are out of my way. Now I'll wrap back. Now I really bail into it. And I think you can see th these turns really cut into the hair. In fact, see how that flares up? Well, now we want to get that flare under control. So we're going to use thread control at this stage. This right here is a buffer zone. This is, this is thread control. And we're gonna just start wrapping back using softer wraps till we get to the end of the shank, work our way back. And as I start back, I'll start to tighten up a little bit. And now we're back here and we have these loose wraps in the body. Well, I'm just gonna go ahead and cut off the waist and then I'm gonna cover over and eliminate the buffer zone completely by wrapping over with tight to anchor that here in place. Okay, when you wrap back over the tail, how, how tight are you gonna go? I'm back this way or this yeah, way? Yeah, back, back towards the bend, you, you, you're you, gonna be adding material. So what you're do you gonna do? be adding materials and you keep these wraps reasonably soft because that happens if you don't. Okay. Thanks, thanks for bringing it up, Gretch. Let me just set this aside now. So where would you use the soft buffer zone or the partial buffer zone 
And here's a, here's a place right here. I want to show you a couple of things. Here is um, what I would call peacock. It's pretty well placed on the hook. It hasn't flared all over the place. And here's the reverse. I made it a little bit shorter so I could notice when I look down at the, at the table that one is the one that's under control and the other one is the material, the uh, fibers are all spread apart. They're spread apart by the tight wraps. Now, how would you control this if you wanted to really anchor it in place and yet, let's see, where is my hook? Here it is. Anchor it in place and yet keep it under control. Well, that's where we're going to use some more peacock. I'll just take this. I got a half of a Sherry's hackle handle here holding this stuff in place for me. And I'm going to start by applying soft wraps. This is gentle wraps. You see those materials stay pretty much together. This is the buffer zone. Okay, now we get up here and we really whale into it right there. Well, you see, it doesn't affect these back here at all. But we have a nicely anchored application of peacock. Now, there was a question from earlier in this evening when, when we were talking about the whip finish tool and all of that with Alan Curie. And here's your answer for you, John Wright. When you do a whip finish, whip finish forward, right at the hook I stop. Now, most of us grab the hook and tighten it up, or we just pull against the hook. Well, Alan hooks this in the, in the eye of the hook and uses it as a pull point. That's kind of handy, don't you think? And that's a tip from Alan Curry in Florida. Any questions? Well, I told you tonight was going to be a shorter night because Gretchen has cinnamon rolls waiting upstairs. Good night. Your and home, that's sorry. a wrap. Thanks for joining us.